Good morning. Happy Father's Day, fathers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 11. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated. As ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we are allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we have behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his children. Amen. The focus of our attention this morning is going to be that of verses 10 and 11. And we are, you are witnesses in God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and his glory. Our fathers, we are here this morning. And we are now into the scriptures. It is the time by which we hear your voice through the written word, through that of preaching. And again, the supervisory work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we ask for his presence to give us a mind to open up, to receive, and to hear. And we ask, Lord, that as we look at this subject of fatherhood, we would give it to it the honor which it deserves as you've put it into that position. Speak to us today freely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, here's a scenario that you probably never hear, but I want to use this as an illustration to um, make a point. Let's just suppose for a moment the President of the United States looked at uh, a, any one of you that owned or operated a business. And the... Uh, uh, Finance Committee of Washington, D.C., they observe that your business has certain uh, practices and you have a model of leadership and finance that uh, puts you into Wall Street within a very short period of time. Within four to five years, you're up there with Forbes and uh, you're, the, you're part of the top ten. And so uh, in a presidential speech to the nation, it is, he makes this stunning remark that by observation of, what, of a business that we saw in Homestead, Florida, as a government agency in our business practice, we're going to model what we do by the same uh, practice and the same standards and procedures that such and so-and-so person has in Homestead, Florida, because we saw that it was very effective. Now, your response to that, other than the fact that you would first to see if somebody maybe uh, did a little bit of photoshopping there and, and modified the speech, voice synthesization. It'd say, well, especially if it was your business, that is just great. To be used, your name used in such a, uh, a position of power, in a place of power and prestige, and your business practice lifted up as a model that a higher standard, a higher authority 
a much greater, larger practice is going to apply. It would be a very honorable statement. And you would accept that. In fact, there would be a certain amount of responsibility that you would automatically take on upon yourself is that you would make sure uh, that your business, even though it was doing well, you're going to fine-tune it. Because if your practice is going to be used as, shall we say, the industry standard, the, the like as, then you want to make sure that it's right. And so therefore, you would uh, accept it as an honorable mention. And at the same time, there would be a, a certain amount of honor that would be given to your business here in this church. Oh, Mr. Stewart, you know, the way you, you manage uh, the, the widget industry here is just phenomenal. And, and, uh, the, and your name is mentioned. It's in Wall Street. It's in uh, the Washington Times and the Washington Post. And the uh, State of the Union message, your name was brought up. And we'd, we was like, this guy is really cool. You know, we would recognize all of that. Now, aside from the fact that, A, it'll never happen, at least not in this presidency or anything like it, it'll probably never happen, you see, you get the point. Whenever, you're, whenever a, something is uh, positioned in with uh, that that is highly recognized and with high regard and of special interest, there's a certain amount of prestige and honor that comes with it, and it says something. It says something about whatever that practice is. And this, my illustration of it is that of finance. So here we read in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul makes uh, this statement in verse 11. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does with his children. This is called a simile. It's a, a, it's a statement of comparison. As a father does his children. If I were to say to you... Um, that guy is like a bull in the china closet. We automatically create an image of a bull, horns, and delicate china sitting where, you know, children are not, you touch it, you buy it, signs. And so a little bit of analysis by, to make the comparison. The bull is all over the place, he's just big, he's bulky, he's careless, his horns swing around, crashing things. And so with that simile, like the like as comparison, you, you have an image in your mind. And so oftentimes we will make those kinds of statements to do what we want to make a point. And the reference of our uh, analogy or the reference of our comparison is something that is vivid, understandable, practical. And we've seen it in action. We know, we don't have to have anybody like I just did explain the damage a bull could do in a china shop. It speaks for itself. And I believe that is why Paul used the illustration of spiritual leadership in the church in the way that he conducted his affairs with the Thessalonian people. He used fatherhood because it speaks for itself. No one had to explain, now this is what dads are supposed to do, and I want to, I want it to be leadership like here's the way it's supposed to be, but it was an understood, and that is the purpose of a simile. As it, what it, a simile does, to give you the, def, the definition of it, it's a figure of speech. And what it does, it makes a comparison of, uh, of two things, of one thing to another. To give you some illustration from the scripture, if you remember in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, the disciples had asked the Lord, teach us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, were his words, pray in this manner. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, simile, as it is in heaven. So in other words, uh, the comparison between God's will and on earth is to be like that of the comparative of what is taking place in heaven. So the reader, the, the one that is praying, would understand that what the prayer request is, that God's plan design, as it's already written out in heaven there, we want to see become active on this earth, similarly, as it is in heaven. Even in our chapter, in, in verse 7, but we were gentle among you, even as a nursing mother with her children. A simile. It's a comparison. 
it speaks for itself. The gentleness of leadership is like that of the gentleness of a mother. So the sermon this morning isn't about leadership. It's really about the simile. And we, we analyze Paul's statement, even as a father uh, that cares for his children in, in verse 11, even as a father does his children, the three things that the father does is that of exhortation and encouragement and then that of giving a charge. It, there's an implicit charge that is there. And it, it would be an understood. But another question I think that, is in, that we might ask ourselves is, why? Why did Paul choose fatherhood as part of his illustration? Why did he choose motherhood? I mean, after all, there are many other similes that he could have used, especially in the world of nature. Um, as a cat cares for its kittens, or an eagle, oftentimes the eagles are used in the scripture, cares for her young. Jesus illustrated uh, Jerusalem and his relationship with God even as I loved you and I protected you as uh, little chickens in the care of the mother or the eagle under the, uh, the wingspan, the eaglets under the wingspan of the parent. Why didn't he use something like that? Shepherding was a common, very much understood, even as the shepherd cares for the sheep or the, you know, these kind of animal illustrations. He didn't. And I believe the reason he didn't use something that is common in nature because it lacked a very important part. It lacked a, a focal point that we are very, very familiar with because one of the, the, uh, the uses of similes is that which is so, uh, so familiar that it really doesn't need an explanation. So when you talk about what is, why the comparison of a father, I would give you these three observations. Number one, he would use this because the father and children uh, represent one of the strongest bonds of human relationship. Father, child represents one of the strongest bonds of human relationship. We have an expression that explains that if there's ever conflict or toil or uh, tension and, and a decision between uh, your two parties, we have an expression, blood is thicker than water. In other words, blood relationships oftentimes will rule even in some of the most difficult decisions, even if they're wrong, because blood is thicker than water. It represents the strongest bond between human relationships. Is there a bond in animal relationships? Yeah, there is, but it's momentary. After a while, they're going to default to instinctive nature as you just life goes so gone. Let's go find dinner. Let's go kill, eat, and consume, but not in human relationships. And so the father-child is is very strong in uh it's built into us i'll give you some examples of that genesis chapter 37 and verse 35 that's when joseph um, is uh, presented to his father as having been eaten by an animal consumed and so his brothers bring this bloody uh, garment, the coat of many colors, and they bring it to the father, and he weeps and he mourns, and as they try to comfort him, it says, and he refused to be comforted. He said, I will go down to the grave onto my son mourning. Why? His son lost in a tragic, seemingly a tragic accident, and he is going to mourn to the grave. Because there is strength in that connection, strength in that bond. In Matthew chapter 30, 27, verse 38, Jesus makes these words, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. My soul exceedingly sorrowful unto death. You hear Jesus speak these words, and we know the rest of the story as well as he did. He knew that there would be a resurrection. He knew that there was going to be a crucifixion, a betrayal, and an unheard of amount of suffering on his body. But why would his soul be sorrowful to the point of death? Because there was going to be a violation of the strongest bond in human relationships, and that is going to be there would be a momentary separation of the love relationship between God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Isaiah speaks of it this way. God, as speaking of his servant, he was smitten of God. In verse 6 of Isaiah 53, 
the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. In verse 8, he was cut off from the land of the living. In verse 9, he makes his grave with the wicked. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. And so Isaiah portrays the suffering Christ. But in each one of, of these verses that I read to you, it depicts Jesus on the other side of the fence. It puts him in the status of wickedness, death, separation, sinful, and smitten of God. And the eyes of God could not look upon evil. And so in that momentary period of time, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is probably that moment when God would have to turn his back upon his own son. And that would bring the most painful anguish, sorrowful unto death that Jesus would ever realize. The strength of a human relationship. Paul points out that the relationship between a father and his children is unbreakable. It is that which exceeds all other ties of friendship and relationships that we would have together. So my point in all that is to say this, that whenever this deep God-given relationship is violated, there is going to be pain. Whenever we violate this kind of, of relationship, this bond, when it's severed or when it's injured or when something comes in to separate it, there is, will always be, without question, some form of either grief, guilt, sorrow, anger, but there will not ever be a, an occasion whereby an, an, any man or any child can just walk away and not have some sense of something is missing, a vacuum, an absence, even though there may be all kinds of methods to try and undo that, it is going to be there, it is God-given. And so it serves to violate the most basic natural law of God. Now, we want to use this to our benefit. I bring that to your attention because to portray the strength of the, of the bond, the depth of that bond that serves as Paul's comparison to say leadership in the church is like that that there is a tie between those that uh, minister to the young or to the others in either the preaching or the teaching or the role of deacons or the role of being a counselor, what have you. There is this kind of, of authority. There is this kind of bond that should be there. And then there would be in that the exhortation, the encouragement, and the charge to do what is right. But at the same time, we would look at this number two, this strong bond that we have there of the father relationship is the strength. Now this bond becomes the strength of parental discipline with a goal. This bond that is there, unbreakable, God-given, becomes the very strength that is needed for parental discipline that comes with a goal. Again, we're reminded of this strength. How does this work? What are the parameters to this? We, we, go, we go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and, and we read again the relationship with Christ and his heavenly Father. And in chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, And when the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears on the hem that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience. Now, the point of that text is to say that the learning process of the Son of God of learning obedience through suffering was rooted in the unbreakable relationship that God had with his son. And so that relationship could be tested. It would be tried. It would be stretched beyond human imagination. 
the strength of that bond is what kept Jesus then in obedience through the suffering. So the stronger the bond, the more that that bond of father-child is built, the, it doesn't give license or latitude to test it or stretch it, but it does mean that the, the measure of structure and teaching and instruction and discipline that is there, we need not fear that the relationship is going to suffer, but rather it is going to maintain itself because of the strength of the bond itself that exists between the father and the child. And so now we appeal to that God-given natural law of the relationship between parent and child. And in appealing to that, we find the liberty to exercise and do oftentimes what is necessary in the, in the practice of discipline. Then on the part of the response of the child to the father, whether it be direct discipline or indirect discipline or words of counsel or, or admonition that, we're, that we fought, read in, uh, the, in our passage in Thessalonians, the response of that child is, it's not that of hatred, it's not that of, of anger or, or trying to get rid of, but it's rather because it's built on the bond of between a, a loving father and it's designed for benefit. Even as Jesus knew that his father's love for him was irrevocable, he would continue to learn. Even though he were a son, he was going to learn this, uh, this obedience through suffering. And that suffering would be the test. It would be that which would rest upon the, 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 the strength of the relationship itself. When we look at ourselves uh, and we consider uh, Hebrews chapter 12, moving to the right a couple of pages, and there we find that the subject of discipline is given to us by Paul, as he writes in uh, verses 5 and 6, and making this statement, and you have, have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children? My son, coming from Proverbs, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So here is the father, the son, the bond that was instituted in this case through redemption, saving faith in Jesus Christ. An individual now is saved by the suffering Savior, and now he is introduced and adopted into the family. And in that adoption, now he becomes a son. And so this, the expression of that love of the father is made, meted out on that, an occasion whereby chastening or discipline is necessary. For whom the Lord loves the strength of the bond, he disciplines. And the child, and we as believers, can take that we understand that it's in the context of love. It's not in the context of retribution or judgment. It's in the context of instruction. And so we receive it because we understand the unbreakable bond of salvation and the eternal security saved by grace in Christ and in him alone. We are risen with him, buried with him, and he is our Savior and all of those terms create the, the depth of that relationship between God the Father and we as his children as one of his own. Then we finally we look at this thought. We consider why the simile of as a father, knowing, number one, that it represents the, the strongest of human relationships, which is, number two, the strength of parental discipline, and number three, is because this is what fathers do. It's just that simple. This is what fathers do. Back to our passage in Thessalonians. They exhort, in verse 11, they comfort, that is, they give encouragement. They charge. They say, here, you want to make sure you do this. It comes with warning. It lays out the possibilities, the consequences, the contingencies. So there's a charge to go and do. This is what fathers do. Some better than others. Some needs uh, practice and training. No, not one of us are perfect. But we don't necessarily have to be taught that. 
It, we take what uh, is the norm, what is built into us, and yet it has to be refined, especially as the scriptures teach us how to be better encouragers and comforters and, and those which uh, give charge to go and do. But it's there. As Paul freely uses the illustration, you have to remember, uh, the Roman citizenship and, and that culture was not exactly the, the greatest of models of family life. I mean, this is a, this is a time that shortly after that, uh, the women would be on a women lib rampage and divorce would just be full blown in, in the form of a cycle. That they would, they would eventually, somehow or another, go back to their former husband. They, 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 and the dowry price would just continue to roll. So the, the family environment wasn't of the best of examples, but yet Paul appeals to that. He would appeal to it in the Jewish culture also, but theirs were not altogether right. Don't forget, it was the parents who said, you talk to your son, and you, you find out, was he blind or was he not blind? And, and so they kind of like just stepped away from the thing because they didn't want to lose business at the local market. They would kind of dump the poor guy, as we would say, throw him under the bus. But so why does Paul freely use the illustration? Because he understands that this is the what fathers do. It doesn't need to be explained. It does, it's not a, a matter of who is better than the other, but it is the practice of the father. And so he says to exhort basically means to come alongside. To comfort is to encourage, and to charge is to give instruction sometimes with warning. The exhortation side can be expressed probably like this. When Jesus was in the garden praying in Luke chapter 22 and verse 43, and we find that he was uh, the excretion of blood coming out of his body and tears and uh, great sweat, drops of sweat came forth as blood. And then we read this one phrase. And an angel appeared unto him from heaven and strengthened him. That is the definition of exhortation. It's to come beside somebody in their most pressing moment, the most distressing moment, when their words of encouragement are needed. It is the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And so the one that, by definition in the Greek, comes alongside of an individual. And this is the role of a father. He comes alongside and he does this. Even as the angel ministered to the Jesus. And even as we have the Holy Spirit that ministers to us. So the dad comes alongside to the child when the airplane breaks. Or when the friends become nasty. Or when they forgot their lunch. Or, and you name it, depending on the age of the child. Then there's the encourage. There is to, it's a time when consolation is given uh, for the events of failure, when there's struggle, struggle, when there's brokenheartedness. And so the dad, by virtue of this is the practice that they do, is uh, there's a tender restoration is there. This is what dads do. And then there's a charge. That is, it's a statements of fact. It's pointing them in the right, right direction. Warning at times. Be careful. Be mindful. Here are the consequences. This is what you want to do that is right. It's instructional. This is what Paul is saying. They he did toward the Thessalonians. This is the, the practice of ministry. And the comparison is to that of the practice of fatherhood. So what does that say to us as dads, as children? You're one or the other. That the, the, the comparison of, of spiritual leadership of the father makes being a father as an honorable role. That's what I said at the very beginning. Paul elevates the status and the role of the dad, puts it up as the substance of leadership in the church. That's an honorable role that we are in. It is the, of all the possible analogies or comparisons or the similes that he could have used, he takes the status and the role of the father. 
and applies it to God's church. What an honor. And then secondly, because God has chosen to honor fathers in this way, we must show honor to our fathers in the role that they have in our life. Because God has chosen to place honor by the use of the simile on the role of the father, it becomes incumbent upon us to show honor to that position, the role of dad in our lives. God did so we would follow through with giving it like place and prestige. That means that our responsibility is to follow through, that as a child we would always have honorable mention of our father, that we would always remember some of his words, some of his counsel, that we would be quick to forget those occasions when by he wasn't the most pleasant and the, and the best of all dads. But we remember his wise counsel, his wisdom, or his, if it's uh, in, happening now, there would be the, the practice of it, giving them the place of respect and reverence and, and joy, make, being a joy to the dad by all the many possible ways that that can take place. So the wall of the father is one of honor, endowed by God as it's used in the scriptures as the, the example and the substance of leadership in the church of the greatest authority in the world, the universe, God himself. It exceeds, it goes beyond the presidency and Washington, D.C. Because those things will vanish over time. But the word of God, the bride of Christ, and the leadership of the church will forever be remembered by God. So it holds a high place of significance. And God lifts fatherhood up to that. And then we as his children, we give honor to our father, our heavenly father, by how we maintain how we treat and show reverence and respect and love and submission to our earthly fathers. So the three are intricately woven together. Our God, we thank you that in your extreme love for the world, in its sinful and rebellious state, your son, whom you love dearly, would follow you in obedience. Give to us a uh, the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, allowing us then to enter into the family relationship where now you would become our father and we would be your child. So, Father, we praise your name that of no merit of our own, we've been introduced into your family. And not only that, there are those inheritances that are ours and the place of of serving in your kingdom and so much more. We praise you and we thank you. We realize, we understand that our mission is to proclaim that good news, and so the invitation always goes forth to anyone that is not in the family of God through Jesus Christ, that, Lord, help them to understand that they can become just that. That they would look up one of the men of the church to speak and ask the questions to know the way of salvation. Help us to honor our fathers, to remember their wisdom, their counsel, their instruction, to speak highly of them, the friends, the family, as examples and illustrations. And then if our fathers are living and we are with them today, that we would demonstrate reverence and, and be a joy to their heart and in a loving in ways and being creative of what we can do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.